Once in a while, a person comes along who makes a significant contribution, either historically or genealogically or in both cases, to some culture that we are familiar with. And in this case, it is Mr. James uh, J. Lopes who has made a significant contribution to the Cape Verdean organization in this country. Mr. Lopes is an honors, gra honors graduate from Harvard College and Harvard Law School and has been a entertainment attorney for the Cape Verdean American organization and he's based in New York City. Mr. Lopes was born in Akushnet, lived in uh, Mattapoisett, and then in New Bedford, where he finally grew up. He has been in the process of compiling a database of over 5,000 names of Cape Verdean people that are here in this country. Their roots, if I might call it that. It will be a most interesting talk. Will you welcome Mr. James Lopes? Well, I wanted to start off today by, by quoting Alex Haley, the uh, godfather to all genealogists. Um, he once wrote, in all of us there's a hunger, marrow deep to know our heritage, to know who we are and where we came from. Without this enriching knowledge, there is a hollow yearning. No matter what our attainments in life, there is still a vacuum and emptiness and the most disquieting loneliness. And when I read those words, I thought about what it was like to grow up in New Bedford being Cape Verdean because you come from such a small minority group that's not written about. Most of the world doesn't know who you are. You travel around the country and people don't understand and people just are always trying to tell you who you are. And about three years ago, I, I uh, decided that I wanted to research my own genealogy. It's, um, because I had grown up hearing from my parents and my grandparents about who Cape Verdeans were and who our ancestors were, yet everything I read said something different. Um, and I realized that our history is very complex, that it's often misunderstood. And then with all the new, um, all the new uh, anthropologists coming through and studying us, that it was being, mis uh, it was being misinterpreted and reinterpreted. So it's been interesting. So I've been researching now for the past uh, three years. I have a uh, database of the family tree now of uh, over 5,000 people. The earliest date is uh, back to 1600, and it's been very, very interesting. The um, basic philosophy has been in constructing this, that if anybody is related to anybody in the family, they're a part of the database. So it's more of a family bush rather than a family tree. But there are over, there are over 5,000 of us, and it's interesting to look at this and to stand back and realize that everything I've read about us is wrong, and everything that my parents and my grandparents told me is right. Uh, this is, Looking at, looking at the family tree now, I can, uh, I can see how when they told us that we were, we were the children of all nations, it was true. I have found ancestors from, from, uh, from India, from China. Uh, most of the ancestors are either from West Africa and Portugal, but they're also from Spain. Um, the the Cape Verdean family tree is very Jewish, which was surprising. We had heard that, we had heard that unofficially, you know, because we heard that We'd heard that said many, many times in, uh, in uh, family gatherings and things, but no one had ever proven it to me. And now that I've gone back, it's been very interesting to pick up all these different, uh, different strands. But let me start with the history of the Cape Cod Islands for people who are unfamiliar. Uh, the islands were discovered by the Portuguese in 1457. When the Portuguese first arrived, they were uninhabited. And so the Portuguese decided to settle the islands following the pattern they had established previously in the Azores and Madeira and that was to resettle uh, families from the mainland in the islands. In this instance, they resettled Portuguese families from Azores and Madeira in, in the various islands. The, there were 10 islands. Uh, some, of the, some of the names might be familiar to you. The Santo Antón and Santiago, which are the two largest islands. San Vicente, which has the main port of Mindelo. Santa Lucia, San Nicolau, Salambo, Vista. Mayu, and Brava, and Fogo. Most Cape Verdean Americans um, come from the islands of Brava, Fogo, or San Nicolau. My own family happens to come from, from San Nicolau and Santo Antón. So the Portuguese arrived in 1455. There's evidence that, that, main, that uh, 
African peoples from the west coast of Africa may have settled in the islands previous to the Portuguese, but there were no lasting settlements there. After the arrival of the Portuguese, uh, slaves were brought into the Cape Verde Islands, and also free Africans from the west coast of Africa joined the population there. And we know that these people came from um, uh, West African groups uh, known as the Bayafaris and the, the um, Jalafas, and the Jalafas, and another, fan, another tribe called the Banyuns. Um, there was all this commerce back and forth. There was a slave trade, other kind of trade between the west coast of Africa and Cape Verde. And Cape Verde was also the crossroads of the Atlantic for the, uh, for the Portuguese colonies. Portugal was making its way down the African coast, so everything had to go through Cape Verde. After Cape Verde, the Portuguese moved on to Guinea, and they moved on to Angola, Mozambique, and Goa. And every time they moved on to a territory, everything came back through Cape Verde. When the Portuguese moved on to Brazil, everything went through Cape Verde again. And then with the slave trade, slaves were bought and sold on the African coast and taken to the island of Santiago. From the island of Santiago, they were sold into Brazil and into the West Indies. Um, so over the years, you have a mix of population here, African and Portuguese. Now, the year 1457 is critical because right after that, you have the Inquisition in Spain. Um, and then you have the Inquisition in Portugal. And the Inquisition was not fully enforced in the colonies, especially in the remote colonies like Cape Verde. Uh, despite the best attempts of the Portuguese government, if you were Jewish and you managed to make yourself make your way to the outpost of the Portuguese empire, you're relatively safe. So large colonies of uh, Jewish settlers went to Santo Antonio in Cape Verde and Boa Vista. You also have the, um, the people who were the new Christians, the Ladinos, uh, who, were, who were Jewish people in Portugal who were forcibly converted to Christianity. A lot of these people were merchants in West Africa, some slave merchants. Um, and all of them mixed in with the Cape Verdean population. You also have the Portuguese settling in Goa and in uh, Macau. It was Portuguese India and Portuguese China. And everywhere the Portuguese went, they brought people back. So you have this incredible mixture of humanity in Cape Verde. So that the Cape Verdeans are you know, probably one of the most diverse uh, population groups in the world. Now, after reading all of this, it was one thing to read it, it was another thing to find all of these people in your own family tree. Okay. Now, Cape Verdeans and America. When you talk about Cape Verdeans and America, you talk about two main industries. You talk about whaling, and um, with respect to Cape Cod, you talk about the cranberry business. Now, the first whaling ships in, from America probably stopped in the Cape Verde Islands in the 1700s. In fact, the first record that I have of a Cape Verdean in America is in 1788. as a cabin boy by the name of Marcus Lopes, who was uh, massacred by Indians in, uh, uh, in America. Um, by the early 1800s, you have Cape Verdeans on board whaling ships. In fact, Herman Melville wrote that the best harpooners in the world were Cape Verdeans. Uh, the Yankee ships from New Bedford would stop in the Azores and Madeira and Cape Verde and pick up crewmen. And these crewmen normally would come to America, stop over, not really settle here in America, but go back to the islands. Eventually, little by little, they started bringing their families over and settling in, in New Bedford. My own family came to this country um, in 1872. My great-grandfather, John DeBrito, was a whaler aboard the D.A. Small, and he um, landed in Provincetown. So the first member of my family is a Cape, uh, Cape Cod, uh, Cape Verdean, Provincetown, 1872. Very shortly after that, he moved to New Bedford and joined the Cape Verdean community there. Uh, over the years, you have a number of Cape Verdeans. You have more and more Cape Verdeans from the islands of Santo Antonio and Brava who boarded whaling ships. And, uh, and I think it's by 1860, Paul Sear can help me with this. I think by 1860, the whaling crews were becoming increasingly Azorian and Cape Verdean. Mm -hmm. And the, large, the largest numbers of Cape Verdeans didn't arrive here until after 1900, but I'll get back to that. Um, until 1864, most of the Cape Verdeans of this country were men. In 1864, the Susan Jane arrived from, uh, from the Cape Verde Islands, and it was, the first, it was the first ship that carried a large number of Cape Verdean women to this country. So it was the first time that Cape Verdeans really established roots in this country. Since 1864. And there were a couple of hundred people on that ship, and they settled in New Bedford, and they started the first Cape Verdean community in New Bedford. Now, I can look at the passenger list of the uh, Susan Jane, and I can recognize a lot of relatives on that, on, on that uh, passenger list. Um, there were 
several thousand Cape Verdeans between 1860 and 1900. Most Cape Verdeans arrived in this country between 1900 and 1920. So in this early period, what you've got is you've got this whaling traffic back and forth between the Cape Verde Islands and, and America, primarily New Bedford. You've also got Cape Verdean communities being established in, uh, along the Cape, also as far south as Connecticut, like in New London. Wherever there was a whaling community, there was a Cape Verdean community. Also in, uh, in Hawaii, there was a large Cape Verdean community. Wherever there was a whaling port, there was a Portuguese community. Wherever there was a Portuguese community, there was a Cape Verdean community. Um, so that's between 1860 and 1900, you have the women starting to come over. Those are the first Cape Verdean families. Now, in those communities, you had people who called themselves Portuguese. During this period, the Cape Verdeans called themselves Portuguese. They were subjects of the Portuguese Empire. So in the, you had Portuguese neighborhoods in cities like New Bedford. And within those Portuguese neighborhoods, you had Madeiran communities, Azorean communities, and Cape Verdean communities. These are the years 1860 to 1900. They shared the same churches, shared a lot of the same organizations. Um, many of the first Cape Verdean immigrants who came to this country were from the island of Brava. And they were primarily lighter-skinned Cape Verdeans. Now, when I say that, you have to understand that you have a society that, by this time, had been mixing for 400 years. So everybody is part something. And it's a society where racial distinctions aren't really made, economic distinctions are made. Um, Belmyra Nunes Miranda, in her book, talks about her uh, grandparents and great-grandparents and describes a, a society in Brava where you had, she had some white ancestors and her some black ancestors and they were both slave-owning families in Brava, but the black family owned more slaves than the white family. So it's not a racial division, it's an economic division. And that's how slavery was in the west coast of Africa also. It's like it was an economic thing. If you had the money, you had the slaves. It was not a racial distinction at all. And the social dynamics of the islands was such that this form of polygamy existed too, and that's unofficial, it's unofficial polygamy. You have, if you were a rich man, you had many wives, but there wasn't officially many wives. What it was is that you had a wife in, the, in one house, and you had other women who, who, um, who were mistresses. Sometimes you married, sometimes you didn't marry, and um, illegitimacy had no, had no meaning at all. The other thing is that illegitimate children, I, let me rephrase that, children of parents who were not married still bore the father's name. So this adds to the complexity of Cape Verdean genealogy. You can have brothers and sisters with different fathers and, uh, well, yeah, different fathers and different mothers. Now the other factor to throw in here, which makes it all even more complex, is that Cape Verde was a society with a very limited land. And in the beginning you had the islands divided up uh, among the wealthiest families. So they had they had large farms which they wanted to keep in the families. It was also a Portuguese tradition to encourage first cousin marriages and second cousin marriages. So you combine those two factors, so what you end up with is generation after generation of everybody marrying their own cousins. Makes it easy, right? <laughs> well, actually it makes it more complicated. Like, <laughs> makes it more complicated because when you come from a family like my father's family in the island of Sane Clau, where the family name is Lopes da Silva, um, Everybody is named Francisco Lopes da Silva, or Antonio Lopes da Silva, Manuel, Manuel Lopes da Silva, in every single generation. There's always one, so you don't know if you've matched everybody up. But that, to take that, that was what was going next. The, the Lopes da Silva family of Sunday Clow is an interesting example of the development of a Cape Verdean family. Francisco Lopes da Silva came from an academic family in um, the province of Minho in Portugal. And the Lopes da Silvas were sent to Cape Verde to set up the secondary school there. And that was Francisco Lopes da Silva. He arrived in 1790. Now, the bishop was a man named Conigo Sabina. And his uh, sister was Mastabina. They were from Goa. They were Indians. And Mastabina went to Sunny Clau to, um, to visit her brother. While she was there, Francisco Lopes da Silva took sick. So Mastabina nursed him back to health. And they fell in love and they got married. So the first generation of the Lopes da Silva family in Sunny Clau was half Portuguese and half Indian. They had seven children six boys and one girl. Of the, of the seven, the woman married um, a Cape Verdean man who in American terms we describe as a mulatto. Of the other sons, of the sons, uh, two of them married 
Jewish women. And two of them, well, the others married other, other people from San Niklau. So the next generation is so diverse, at least three different ethnic groups in the next generation. And as you come down, and then their children, their children married each other because they were cousins. They wanted to keep the land in the family. And it comes down generation by generation. We had a family reunion last year. And I have a computer program that will print out my entire database. Everybody in, showing all the connections. The database defied the computer. <laughs> it just wouldn't print it. I had to send the, I had to send the deba database to the man who designed the program. And he uh, called me up and said, the problem is that your family is so inbred and so interrelated that it just confounded the computer. <laughs> and he had to do a special run for me. But that is because these, in the islands, they all intermarried. And then everybody came to America and they insisted that their children marry Cape Verdeans. So before they were intermarried by island, once they got here, they, were in, they intermarried among the Cape Verdean community. So now it was all the people from San Nicolau marrying all the people from Brava, which meant that by the second generation in America, if we hadn't been related in Cape Verde, we were all related in America. <laughs> Cape Verde is such a, no, Cape Verde is such a remote colony of Portugal that rules weren't always enforced in Cape Verde. You know, and they were very de they're also very desperate to have people live there because it's a very, it's a very desolate place. It's a very, a very dry place. When, when the colonists first got there, they, they cut down all the trees, um, which ruined the rain cycle. So the droughts and famines all the time. It's very hard to get people to live there. It was, it was especially hard to get white people to live there uh, to the extent that the Portuguese started sending uh, convicts and, and, uh, and other people there. It, was, it became the colony of, of second, your second chance. You know, you don't want to be in a prison, we'll give you a, like Australia, we'll give you a second chance in Cape Verde. Yes. Well, the other factor, too, is you're talking about islands, and there were just so many people that, that are available. You know, and, and also, if you're, you're talking about a community like the Cape Verdean communities of America, they were so uh, insular that you just wanted to marry your own kind. And you married your cousins. So that, to a certain extent, it simplifies the, the, the task of the genealogist because you keep running into the same lines again. To a certain extent, it complicates it, sorting out all the people. The old joke, genealogy, you wouldn't want us to marry strangers. <laughs> <laughs> but given, given that background, it's, uh, how, do you, how do you start researching Cape Verdean genealogy? What I always tell people is to start with, um, start the way I did, sit down with your relatives and ask. I asked my parents, who are all your cousins? And I made a list of all their cousins, and basically I tried to draw a road map from my parents to each one of the cousins. And I'm still trying to connect them, still trying to pull them all in. And it actually, it, it actually works very well, because if I find out that so-and-so is a cousin of, this one's a cousin of my mother, this one's a cousin of my mother, and they know they're cousins of each other, then I know who the common relative is. And it's, it's worked very, very well. And I started, started that way and started, okay, start that again. I know, I know that, that there is a family named, theoretically, the Gilberts. And I know that the Gilberts are my mother's cousins. I also know that the Gilberts are um, the cousins to another family, the, um, the Gomeses. And I know the Gomeses are my mother's cousins. So what relative do they have in common? So I go back another generation. The mother in the Gomes family is a Gonzales. The mother in the Gilberts family is a Gonzales. And my great-grandmother is a Gonzales. So if I know that you just find the common relative in the three of them. So just pick out these cousins and then look at their parents and try to match them together. And so they're actually, it's not, well, there's also another interesting roadmap with Cape Verdean names. I don't know if this is true with, uh, so much with, with the other Portuguese. And that is that usually there is, some, there is some indicator in the name of what the ancestor's name is. Like my father is Manuel Antonio Lopes and his father was Antonio Manuel Lopes. And so I thought that his father would be Manuel Antonio Lopes, but it turns out that his name was Manuel Marcos Lopes. And I found that out because my grandfather's nickname was Anton Many Mark. <laughs> to distinguish him from the other Antonio Lopeses. Mm. Just like my mother is, um, my mother's name, my grandmother's name was Maria Luisa de Brito. But everybody called her Maria Nia Luisa which meant that Nya Luisa put in there meant that her mother's name was Luisa. So by the nicknames, you always know what the parent's name is. 
so that Paul and I were talking about a lot of the Cape Verdean obituaries have nicknames in them, these strange obituary, uh, strange nicknames, but that's where a lot of the nicknames come from. What you do is you insert the, uh, the parent's name in there so you can distinguish this manual Lopes from this manual Lopes because there are a lot of manual Lopes out there. And so every generation does that. And a lot of the generations will, um, they'll just keep flipping manual Lopes and manual Antonio, Antonio Manuel, going all the way back. I was able to do that with my father's family. But what tri tripped me up there was I didn't realize that my father was not the one that was designated to carry on the name. You know, so he had a brother who was actually had the name that was passed on. Anyway, I have, another, I have a handout here that gave a guide to Portuguese names, Cape Verdean names, and how they've been anglicized. Because once people came to this country, America had fun with their last names. Um, there's an indication, some of the spelling variations, some of these are very common names. Um, Sylvia is one of the most common, commonly distorted names. There are uh, six variations here, as you can see. Some of the less obvious ones are like Andrews is actually Andre and DeAndre. When I, leave, when I talk to friends of mine from outside New England, they are really surprised that I think that names like Perry, Andrews, and Morris are Portuguese names. You know, I hear those names, and I think those are Portuguese names, but outside New England, they think that the, the, uh, the, you couldn't get more Yankee names. Look at Rodrigues, Rogers, Rodrigues, Rodriguez. It could be Roderick, Rodericks, Rogers, Rogers of the D, Roderick. Ro Pina has, like, so many variations. Um, Garcia. Now, Gilbert was an interesting one because I, I didn't know why, where that name had come from. And then when you go back, it's not very helpful because it's Gilmet, which is also not a um, Portuguese name. And you see some of the old spellings of it, and I don't, it may have been, French. yeah. I don't know if they changed it to a French spelling. There are were, there were a lot of French families in Cape Verde with names like Montran. Um, there are Italian families, like there are a lot of uh, Cape Verdean Camillos and uh, Lacerdas. Excuse me? <laughs> well, the, the Genoese were there. The, they, they were, the Genoese, the Italians, the Italian flag flew over Cape Verde, I think, for two years. Uh, yeah. And there were a lot of, a lot of English names of people with uh, a lot of Cape Verdeans named Spencer. Um, here's an interesting one, Jibo, which we pronounce Jibo, but it's actually G-I-B-A-U, which should be Jibao. But some people pronounce it Jibo, and it's some people, on some of the old passenger lists, it's G-U-I-B-A-U-L-T. I spent a session with Paul Sear from the Medford Public Library going through a passenger list once. We're trying to interpret some of the names. And you just have to keep repeating them phonetically until you understand what they are. Like Gonzales, Gonzales can uh, change into Gonzales. Um, I was once working for the Boston Bicentennial Commission, trying to sell some advertising for uh, William Colonial Williamsburg, and the head of advertising there was a Mr. G O N S A L E S. So I thought that I would um, use the ethnic angle, and I said, Mr. Um, can I speak to Mr. Gonzales. It's Mr. Lopez. And his secretary said, I'm sorry, Mr. Gonzales is out of the office today. <laughs> so I said, you just tell him Mr. Lopes called. So. <laughs> so we have seven different versions of Rosario, which can be shortened to Rose, uh, or Rosario with an S, Rosario with a Z, same thing with Barboza. Uh, Cruz has several variations. Barrows is another one that can look very English. Uh, Costa, my mother's family name is Costa. Uh, it can be Da Costa. One of my uncles got tired of all the Da Costas, so he changed his name to La Costa. So he's kind of hard to find in the records. He's La Costa. And then there are the Oliveras or the Oliviers. Then the Anglicized name, different category. I saw a tombstone at St. John's Cemetery in New Bedford where, where there is a father, father and son, same name, one's senior, one's junior, except one is Firmino, one's Freeman. One's what? One's Firmino. Yeah. The father's Firmino, and the son is Freeman. Okay, but it's, it's junior, but he's still a junior. I found that interesting. Pereira, Perry, Leighton, the judge, the Cape Verdean judge and um, federal judge in uh, Chicago, uh, George Leighton. His name is Leighton. When he was in the third grade attending a school in New Bedford, his third grade teacher sat him down and said, you're very bright, George, but you'll never get anywhere in this country with the name Leighton. Your name is Leighton from now on. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of his family is still named Leighton. <laughs> Uh, Conceição's conception. Pedro is the translation. Stone. Uh, Andre to Andrews. Now this was interesting. I was looking for a branch of the family called Morris. 
Uh, and it turned out on the passenger list, it's Meres. And the name became Morris, anglicized to Morris. And in this country, it's interesting, a lot of the Morrises became doctors and lawyers. Over in Cape Verde, they're doctors and lawyers. And, it's all, and their uh, family names, I think, it's, I think it may be one of the um, old Jewish families. I'm not sure. I know that the, um, the names are very, uh, they're all Sarah and Esther and Jacobus. And, you know, it's just like the Lopes de Silvas, my father's family. All the writers in Cape Verde are from the Lopes de Silva family. Um, Balthazar Lopes de Silva, Jose Lopes de Silva, Manuel Lopes, all the poets and writers, generation after generation, because they were the ones who, they were the teachers and the writers in Cape Verde. And in this country, there were a lot of um, uh, Lopes, de Silva, Lopes descendants who were inclined in that direction. Very interesting. One of the problems you get in the whaling records is a guy named is Joachim. They call him Joe King. Joe King, and because you're King. King family, you haven't the slightest idea what his surname was because it's the second syllable of his first name. So that stops King. right there. And you do see lots of people named King, and I bet a lot of them in some of the was Joe, Joe King. Joe King, King yeah. Like that. All I knew him was Joe King. But then I learned later on it was Joker. Joker, yeah. And and this last name I learned later on was De Silva. Mm -hmm. And my name is Sylvia. Mm -hmm. And his wife, my aunt, was a Sylvia. And he was a Sylvia. Only De Silva. Mm -hmm. So you talk about changing and uh, names changing. I couldn't couldn't believe it. Are almost all the names on your first list also names in Portugal? Those are all Portuguese names. Those are, yeah, those are all, I don't know if Jibo, um, I think that these are all Portuguese names. Yeah. One name, like Brito. Brito, that's a Portuguese name also. De Brit. De Brit, yeah. And then you have the compound names, lots of Portuguese compound names. And those have been very interesting. Um, you would never know, looking at the name, the family name is Ramon du Cantu. But I have relatives who are Cantus and who are Raymonds. Try to find them on a on a uh, passenger list when the name is Ramon du Cantu. You know, some some of the family became Raymonds. I don't know if any Ramons. They became Raymonds, and some of the family became Cantus. Um, there's another branch of my family that's descended from some Freitas Coelhos. Originally, the family's from the Azores, and then settled in Cape Verde. They were surprised to go to a, a tombstone and find out the finally find the grave of an ancestor, and he was a Coelho, even though they became Freitas's people decide which name they're going to keep because in America you don't keep hyphenated names. Or in my own family, the Lopes de Silvas, um, some of them stayed Lopes de Silva. It's a, it's a very prestigious name now in Cape Verde to be called Lopes de Silva and to have held on to it because most of the Lopes de Silvas became either Lopes's or Silva, especially when they came to this country. In fact, what has happened is that they came to this country and because some went to Lopes, some went to Silva, they, they, they no longer know they're related to each other. And people have been horrified when I've shown them the, um, the list. Yeah. Well, the other category of names that I didn't put on this list is there are a lot of there are a lot of Jewish names in the Cape Verde Islands. A lot of people who uh, look at the pa old passenger list. People with the names Cohen, Levy, Ben Rose, Ben David, Abraham, Ben David. Abraham, Ben. Packard. Yeah. That's the first time I was doing the packet list when I said <laughs> Abraham, Ben David. That's not a bad. Jewish sound to it, <laughs> Abraham, Ben David, and Ben, yeah. ben Rose. Family, that's another Jewish name. I don't know, know them. Yeah, from Rabat yeah. originally. Well, there were a lot of, in the early 1800s, there were uh, there was a whole colony of uh, Jews from Morocco mm -hmm. who settled in Santo Anton. Mm -hmm. It's in the island of Santo Anton, there was a town called Synagoga, where there was, uh, there used to be a Jewish synagogue there. There were also um, a number of Jewish cemeteries. In fact, there's some material here about some Jewish, Portuguese Jewish organizations which are uh, starting to renovate uh, Jewish cemeteries in the Cape Verde Islands. It was sort of one of the last refuges for, for uh, Jews who were expelled from Portugal. And a lot of those people are also the same people, same families that settled in Curacao. You know, and some of the, I think, I think there's a connection to Newport too, because a lot of the Newport Jews were Portuguese. Mm -hmm. And they were Portuguese from the colonies. There's a big family out of Newport called Lopez. Lopez, right. Oh, well, Benjamin Cardozo, the, the, the Supreme Court Justice, another one. It's, um, yeah, so it's interesting. So there's a whole group, a group of uh, names there. Like my great-grandmother's name was uh, Simone de Lima. We knew her as, her last name is Delgado. So her, her family name was Simon. And her mother's name was Simon, and her father's name was Lima. So she's Simone de Lima. 
you know, it's another one of those. And there were also some, there were some names that my Cape Verdean friends tell me that they know are uh, Portuguese Jewish names. I can't identify them. I, just, I know Mendes and Fonseca. From what I've read, the Jews in Cape Verde decided to assimilate for survival. And it's probably one of the few instances where, where well, I shouldn't, I'll take that back. I was going to say one of the few instances where, where they decided to assimilate with Africans. But at, at this point, they're all Cape Verdeans. Yeah, so. Is that synagogue still there? No, it's the just the just town name. Oh. Just the town name, Synagoga in Santo Antonio. Yeah, and there were a lot of uh, Jewish... There, were, there aren't a lot of... From what I've read, there were not a lot of practicing Jews in Cape Verde, but there are a lot of people who light candles on Fridays and keep kosher and things. They do things, but they don't know why. They're Moranos. And they were in Boa Vista in Santo Antonio. There were a few Jewish families, and there are a few families that have come over here and uh, revived their Jewish practices. Yeah. yeah question. I know I'm just stumbled into this, but what's the difference ethnically between Cape Verde and the Azores? Um, the difference is, the difference is that the Cape Verdeans are, most Cape Verdeans are racially mixed. Uh, Portuguese, well lots, lots of things. The Azores are not. Um, the Azores, no. There's a small percentage of people in the Azores and Madeira. It depends. It's, uh, there, were, there were slaves in the Azores and Madeira. And there were also slaves in the continental Portugal, just like Sicily. And when you're talking about 500 years of people living together, and you go there now, there, there are no black people. They must have gone someplace. You know, they're... And the Portuguese have a different, have a different sensitivity to race than, than most, uh, most societies do. But in Cape Verde, people, everybody admits that they're, they're mixed. Um, there are some exceptions to that. Uh, officially, the islands are, I think, 10% white. Uh, the statistics they give out, 10% white, 70% mulatto or creole, and then 20% African. And most of the pure Africans are in the island of Santiago. The island of Santiago is larger than the rest. Most of the Cape Verde Islands are very tiny, they're very rocky, and they could not sustain large plantations, so you didn't have uh, great numbers of slaves. But Santiago was a plantation island, and slavery wasn't abolished in the Cape Verde until 1878. But there's a racial census of Cape Verde in 1854 that um, indicates that most of the slaves in the islands were on the island of Santiago, and there were less than 5,000 slaves in all of the other islands in 1854. In fact, there, it's one of the interesting things about Cape Verde is that all the old slave records are uh, still in existence. So you can actually go down a slave record, see somebody's name, what tribe they came from, what particular skills they had. This one's a weaver. This one's a, a blacksmith. And you can see the name and the name of the person who owned them. I've, I've gone through that list and found the uh, names, of, names of my ancestors as major slaveholding families in the uh, you know, San Nicolau. I mean, that's, as, as a genealogist and as a Cape Verdean and as an African-American, it's very disturbing to go <laughs> researching your family history and find slaveholding families. But, um, uh, you know, and you step back from that and you realize that most people have slaveholding ancestors, so. And you get past that, but I look at I look at the list, 1854, and I found my um, I found the name of someone who could have been my great great grandmother, same name, same town, and she owned slaves. Um, I've also read that most of the slaves in Cape Verde in 1854 were um, house servants. They called criados. Criados were usually um, it's a system the Portuguese had where you had poor relations and poor relatives that you that lived with you and helps you out helps you out with household tasks but they never got paid. And it's rather than putting your relatives in the streets, they live with you. Or poor people in town live with you and they're your servants. And it's a system that they brought over to America, too, because on South Water Street in the late 1800s, early 1900s, people had spare rooms and they had criados. They had criados. When we grew up in New Bedford in the 50s, one thing you told your parents when they said, go clean your room, you'd tell them, I'm not your criado. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not your criado, I don't do that. <laughs> Yeah. What's the, uh, uh, the definition of Creole? What is that? Um, Creole. Creole is... Creole people are people who are mixed European and African ancestry. Um, there are different kinds of Creoles. The first Creoles were English Creoles in West Africa. And it's a whole society, it's a whole culture that's a blend of the two. It's a, and the difference between Creoles and mulattoes is that society accepts the fact that with Creoles, you embrace both parts of your ancestry. 
you, you acknowledge that you're black and you acknowledge that you're white and you have your own language, you have your own culture, you have your own food, and people recognize that it's a blend. In this society, what happens is that when a black person and a white person have a child, there's, it's as though the white ancestry never existed, which is ridiculous. You know, but that's, that was the American mentality, except for Louisiana, is that the uh, black people who were of mixed ancestry were not allowed to claim both parts of their ancestry. But Creole, with Creole societies, you claim both parts of it. So the people of uh, Louisiana, French Creoles, and Haiti, the certain society of the Creoles, the only people in America who are Creoles that are recognized as accepting both parts of the society are Hispanics. Most Hispanics are Creoles. They mix black and white and sometimes Indian, too. They have their own language. Yeah. Um, most Creoles have, they have, like, the Cape Rodians have Creole. We yeah. speak, we refer to ourselves as Creoles. Yeah, and the Haitians and all these other people, yeah. But it's, it's based, what it really comes down to is the blend, it's the blend and recognizing that blend. That's what, that's what makes it different, so. Well, in, in uh, his introduction, Mr. Sophie mentioned, um, Marilyn Halter's book on Red Between Race and Ethnicity. It's an academic treatise on Cape Verdean immigration to the U.S. And it includes a lot of oral histories and it summarizes a lot of other materials about Cape Verdeans. So, um, other than that, the, I think the best source I've ever seen is Belmara Nunes Miranda's autobiography. Um, it, her family came over here in 1900 and she talks about growing up in the Cape, going to Radcliffe and becoming a Cape Verdean educator. She passed away last year. But the problem with that book is that it's an oral history, and oral histories are sometimes very dense to read. You know, so. Well, the, be the best introduction to Cape Verdean culture is going to be this summer at the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian uh, Institution in Washington this summer is having the Folklife Festival, and the centerpiece of the Folklife Festival will be, will be Cape Verdean history and culture. And they're really excited about it because for the first time, what they will be doing is having a foreign culture plus the American the American expression of it. Normally they have a foreign culture, like uh, Russian culture, and they don't involve Russian Americans. But what they're doing with Cape Verdeans is that they're having Cape Verdean culture and Cape Verdean American culture, how it's been maintained in, in this country. And what's interesting about that is that Cape Verdean immigration in this country was cut off in 1921. When the immigration laws were changed, um, Cape Verdean uh, immigration in the U.S. was cut off. Up until that point, Cape Verdeans used to just, just get on boats in the islands and sail into New Bedford Harbor. You know, about a thousand a year. And, you know, not go through Ellis Island, they just got on boats in Cape Verde and sailed right, up, right into New Bedford. And in 1921, that was cut off, so there was this break in Cape Verdean society. There's the old families, the old generations, and there's nobody until 1965, so the trickle between them. So what's happened is that the Cape Verdean culture that we know in, in America is sort of a snapshot of Cape Verde in the uh, uh, turn of the century. So the culture we've maintained, the music we know, the dances we know, the food we know, they don't have in the islands anymore. So the Smithsonian recognized that and they're bringing them together. And so in the planning of this program, we've learned so much about them, they've learned so much about us, and they've asked the Cape Verde Americans to go back to the islands and reteach some things. The language is so different, you know, because the, um, everything we think of as being Cape Verdean, to them is just old fashioned. <laughs> you know, so anyway, there'll be the festival this summer. What date is it? It's uh, the last, last week in June and the first week of July. Yeah. Um, borrowing something from the, uh, uh, there was the Mashpee presentation this morning. It's a note here. I like some notable Mashpee Indians. I thought I'd do some notable Cape Verdean Americans. Um, everybody, I think everybody knows the name of Sweet Daddy Grace, born in Brav in 1891, became an evangelist, had millions of followers, but at the time of his death, uh, another one is the uh, first baseman for the uh, Dodgers, Davy Lopes. Um, and the, well, this is the group Tavares. And also, there's, there was a group back in the 50s that, uh, that had, had a hit with a song called Happy Birthday, Baby, Baby, and they were from the Cape. They're from the Cape. Uh, there's another group that just topped the charts in the past two weeks in TLC. Their lead singer is named Lisa Lopes. She's Cape Verdean. Horace Silver, the jazz musician. Paul Gonzales was a tenor saxophonist for uh, the Duke Ellington Band, another Cape Verdean. And uh, a recent discovery most people didn't realize, and I'm sure she doesn't realize it yet, is that uh, Lena Horne. Lena Horne, on uh, one side of Lena Horne's family, she is descended from a Portuguese-speaking Negro from the west coast of Africa named Scotran. I don't know how Scotran gets to be a Portuguese or a Cape Verdean name, but to me that sounds like they have to be Cape Verdean. So. 
Everything I have, everything I have learned, I have gotten from the New Bedford Public Library. Right. All the research, the family has been in New Bedford for 120 years, so birth records, death records, marriage records, whaling records, everything from the New Bedford Public Library. It's a tremendous resource. It's the best resource on Cape Verdean genealogy, and uh, it's been very, very helpful for me. Uh, one, one last thing on, on uh, this goes back to the question on race and ethnicity. Um, one of the most interesting things about doing Cape Verdean genealogy is after you've collected the documents, you go through them and you focus on the racial classifications that they have applied to Cape Verdeans over the years. And this is fascinating. I've uh, put them all together for my family and I've tracked different relatives and you can see how people came into this country as Africans or mulattoes. They married as white people. They have, say they had six or seven children, two black, two white, two colored. And these people had children different colors. The official records every year change. It doesn't, it, it depends on who's, who's marking it down. The census records, every year. I'll show you a picture of my grandfather, which confirms this story. I think everybody will find this very amusing. When the census taker came around, to, they saw my grandmother, who was a black woman, and wrote her down in the surveys being black, and they asked her about her husband, who was on a whaling ship at the time. And because he was her husband, they said he was a black man. <laughs> And this is so typical of Cape Verdean families. It's like the, you, can, you can be born into one race, you can, you can grow up in another, and you can die in a lot, another one. Well, there's, there's a book called The Negro Immigrant, which came out around 1910, and uh, The Negro Immigrant, and it, uh, there's a whole chapter devoted to New Bedford, and it talks about the um, Negro immigrants from the Azores, Madeira, and Cape Verde, and it, it, it compares to different communities. And there's another one called Two Portuguese Communities in Massachusetts, and they talk about the Negro immigrants from the Azores. And I found some other books that talk about the Negro immigrants from, from Sicily. So it's very, very interesting how the, how the classifications have changed over the years. Yeah. And I was told at one time when they wanted to do a school census in New Bedford, the school superintendent just threw his hand. Oh, I can tell that story. <laughs> <laughs> that was 1965. I lived through that. Yeah. What happened was in the state of Massachusetts, the Racial Imbalance Act, and um, because of the segregation of the Boston and Springfield schools, they decided that they had to um, they had to determine that the schools were racially imbalanced. They took a census everywhere in the state. So they. Um, so they, they sent home index cards to every family in, in the state, and you had to indicate if your child was white or non-white. So I went to a school that was 90% Cape Verdean, yet when the census results came out, it was 20% non-white. And so the city submitted its results. They had no segregated schools in the city of New Bedford. And the school committee was taken to court over that because the state of Massachusetts said, you have segregated schools. And the city of New Bedford said, if these people aren't white, we want you to come in and tell them that. We won't do that. <laughs> and it went to the Massachusetts Supreme Court, where the Massachusetts Supreme Court told the city of New Bedford, you go back and you find your black people. You find your black people so that ultimately they ended up sending state marshals to the schools in New Bedford who stood in the doorways and went in the classrooms and counted us and told us which you're black, you're white. <laughs> and Ultimately, they ended up you, saying, this brother is black, this one is white. And it was the Cape Verdeans and the Puerto Ricans in New Bedford who were, who were saying, well, you can't divide us up racially. So ultimately, we decided that our, this one school that was 90% Cape Verdean ends up being 55% uh, non-white, which means they missed a few of us. <laughs> there has been a real, this has been a real change in philosophy, and I'd say, more so since the Cape Verde Islands became independent in 1975. Before 1975, it was difficult saying you were, well, Cape Verdeans said they were Portuguese because the islands belonged to Portugal. But at the same time, with being a younger Cape Verde, a younger generation, uh, you realize that you were assimilating into American definitions of race, okay? And that people weren't going to accept, they, even though they will take someone who looks like you and accept the fact that they're Puerto Rican and not question it, they won't accept the fact that you're Cape Verdean. You know, they've never heard of that. It's, it's just so strange. And when, to me, it makes no sense. Anyway, so what's happened is that after the, the wars for independence from Portugal were very, very ugly. Were very, very ugly. It was the Cape Verdeans who led the war for independence in Guinea, and also Cape, the Cape Verdean administrators were in Angola and Mozambique. And the unraveling of the Portuguese empire 
occurred because these Portuguese, the Portuguese had sent Cape Verdean administrators to those territories, and in the territories they thought of themselves as being Portuguese. But when they went back to Portugal, they were treated like Africans. So they went back to the colonies, and they said, we are all Africans, and they, they threw the Portuguese out. And that was the unraveling of the Portuguese empire. Amilcar Cabral, who led the revolution in Guinea, was a Cape Verdean. Uh, all of his lieutenants were, were Cape Verdeans. And while that was going on over there, we had the 60s going on here in America, and we were assimilating in America and identifying as African Americans. You know, so the two came together. So I'd say after 1975, most Cape Verdeans stopped saying that they were Portuguese. And the Cape Verdeans were very proud to say they were Cape Verdeans instead. I don't, I don't think there is a substantial number of, um, there is not a significant Cape Verdean, there's not a large Cape Verdean community in Fall River. But I want to make one other point about what you were saying about identifying as Portuguese. As a genealogist, it is interesting to start digging here and then realizing that your family is Portuguese. You know, um, if you have, as you go back into different lines, will end up in Portugal. Uh, some will, you know, some will, they go in different directions, but it's interesting to go back and realize that after a certain point, you're back in the Azores, you're back in Madeira, you're back in continental Portugal. My family is very quickly back in, back in Madeira on my mother's side. On my father's side, they're in Portugal in 1790, but another line on my mother's, my mother's line, they're in, they're, um, within three or four generations, they're in Spain, Barcelona, Spain. So you have to, you have to also accept that, but realize that the only description that really identifies you is Cape Verdean, because it, it, it encompasses everything. Among those people? There's an interesting, the interesting background on that, and that is that the Portuguese made an effort to educate the Cape Verdeans because they wanted to make, they wanted to draw the line between, Cape, between Europe and Africa on the other side of Cape Verde. They wanted to make sure that Cape Verde was part of Europe and not part of Africa. Now, in the Azores and Madeira, you have white Portuguese, okay? So they're white already. They're already Portuguese, okay? In Cape Verde, we want to educate these people. And when they're educated and they become literate, the first thing they learn to write in the elementary schools is, I am Portuguese. It was part of the brainwashing. I am Portuguese. So they were raised, that, uh, it was part of the propaganda. But the, the benefit of it was that people were literate. And the Cape Verdeans had the highest literacy rate of all the Portuguese immigrants when they entered this country. But on the African mainland, the Portuguese didn't educate their, their, um, the Africans at all. There were no schools in Guinea and Angola, Mozambique, and those people were not sent to universities. Cape Verdeans were sent to universities in Portugal all the time. But there was no place for them to go afterwards. I mean, they could become educated Portuguese in the African territories, but they couldn't be educated Portuguese in Portugal. That's all I had to say. And I would like to say, Mr. Lopes, that you've given a most illustrated and educational talk. I grew up in New Bedford in the teens and 20s, and I know some of the things that you were referring to. I recognize it as I grew I up. I recognize it being Thank true. Thank you very, very much. Shiva Rapa, 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 Shiva Rapa,